वेलकम एवरीबॉडी टू आवर पॉडकास्ट चैनल कॉल्ड कॉस्मोपोलिस एज यू ऑल नो कॉस्मोपोलिस इट्स एन इनिशिएटिव बाय द लैन स्कूल ऑफ लिबरल आर्ट्स वेयर वी सॉर्ट ऑफ प्लेटफॉर्म कन्वर्सेशंस अराउंड अ वैरायटी ऑफ टॉपिक्स इंक्लूडिंग पॉलिटिक्स हिस्ट्री साइंस टेक्नोलॉजी फिलोसफी एंड टुडे वी आर वेरी ग्लैड टू हैव अ डिस्कशन अराउंड साइंस कम्युनिकेशन बिकॉज आई थिंक दैट्स वन ऑफ द uh things we really want to pursue going forward and we are more than glad to have professor jamie barber from all the way from the university of buffalo uh she has come here to bangalore as a fulbright nehru fellow and she is working uh, as i come to understand with the uh, with the happening very happening science gallery in the city which is sort of redefining what it means uh, to do science and public outreach around science uh, and stuff like that so uh once again we are very happy to have you uh she just spoken to our students uh, on uh, the non fiction form but i think in our conversation we would like to you know talk more centrally about science uh, communication so so welcome professor uh, barber again and uh, so just jumping straight into the topic uh, you know i want to talk about uh the uh, thing that you started with like you know the the sense that while on one hand science is you know presumably about facts but facts alone don't uh, you know convey uh, a scientific idea or a scientific uh, you know article as much as a narrative does and uh, uh, so you know can you just talk more about that and how you got thinking about all these issues yeah thank you so much for having me this is a very exciting uh, program to be part of so i'm i'm really excited to be talking about uh science writing uh science communication um so i really love this question right so you know why do we need something like science narrative or science journalism or science communication right if we think about the way science is done then uh some researcher somewhere is researching a specific topic and then you know he or she or they will write an article that tells us you know their findings and so in some sense we feel like well isn't the writing already done however you know there's there's one big reason we need uh some kind of science communication um is this idea of the the purpose of a piece of writing so first a scientific journal is written really for a scientific audience because if i'm a researcher and i'm writing that the one of the main reasons i'm writing that article is to prove to the scientific community that i've done my work that my research was good of course i'm also going to describe my findings okay but my audience is mostly other scientists Now if you're a science communicator, your main audience is people who may or may not be scientists. They might be, but they don't have to be specialists, right? So on one hand, we need that like sort of translator in the middle. And that translator can be somebody who is themselves a scientist. Many scientists I know move into science communication. Um but it might be somebody else who's developed communication skills, you know, and they don't inherently have to be a scientist. So they're doing that sort of translation work to connect to the reader, right? So maybe I don't know that much about neurology and I and I want to know this new science about the way the brain works. A science communicator can help me know that by maybe translating some of the jargon um or not simplifying the science in the sense of, you know, dumbing it down or making it uh not as complex or not showing the complexities, but simplifying some of the language that I might not understand. or maybe providing a metaphor or extra explanation for a um non-specialist. But then this gets to your question. Then there's this idea of narrative and the way the human mind works, the way the human uh I think heart and mind connect to this concept of story. So I can read the science, right? That's in front of me and know that okay, the the research was done and I care about this science. But if it doesn't really match with values i already have whether that be cultural values religious values what i already feel or think about uh gender or education or race or class or caste i'm not going to like that science right like if it if it pushes against me i'm going to maybe say that that science isn't for me or that science is threatening or scary or wrong so but If science is in a narrative, then sometimes we can connect with it in a way that's different than just connecting to the facts, right? So if I'm reading um a science narrative that's talking about how this sort of new 
scientific process or discovery or idea is working in the life of someone. And that can be the life of the writer, or they can be out uh, interviewing somebody who, who has done this new thing, right? So let's take it back to my first example, uh, something about neurology. If there's something about brain functioning that's new that we've discovered through science, you can tell me those details and I either won't care about them or if they challenge my norms, I might not believe them. But if you go out and interview someone who this new neurological finding affects, then they're telling their story. So then I care because I'm like, here's a person who was affected by this discovery or this new innovation or whatever. And then, so both I'll remember it more, but it might be harder for me to refute because I can see the way that that science is working in the lives of other people. Yeah, and uh, it just occurred to me that, I mean, uh, uh, an example, uh, because you said that uh, science communication, obviously, in some sense, uh, is geared towards uh, non-specialists. But it occurred to me that right now, in fact, I'm using uh, what is effectively a popular science textbook. Uh, mm. It's written by Charles uh, Pitzold. It's called The Annotated Turing. So mm. it's got, uh, it takes Turing's paper on computability. And what it does is that it intersperses the paper with bits about Turing's, Alan Turing's biography, you know, uh, his role in the war, his homosexuality, etc. And, uh, you know, and even the very fact that, very interesting facts that when he came up with this paper, Alonzo Church in the US came up with the same idea. And, you know, how he was both worried and excited by that fact. And, you know, so some of these things which are missing in, uh, you know, science textbooks. So, I mean, if I can push your thesis forward, uh, one of my uh, personal interests is to make the claim, and I think we were talking about that, that science communication can actually help even science students generate a true interest in science and, uh, you know, make textbooks, make pedagogy uh, more exciting. So, was that something that, you know, I think you would like to respond to. Yeah, that's really interesting that you said that. And I think it's great that you brought up Turing specifically because I will say one of the reasons why I remember so much about Alan Turing actually is because the, the two first ways that I was really introduced to him were through science narratives. Um, there was a, a science podcast that I was listening to um, many years ago actually, but it, it was talking about emergent theory is really what it was talking about. Um, but there was a section in there about Turing and his work, right? And so that was just the first time at the time. I didn't know who he was. I just hadn't done my research on him. And so he was part of this wider story about how we think about emergence um, and how we think about uh, the, the way in which like patterns emerge, right? Yeah. So, so there was that, right? I didn't just get like, okay, here's Al Alan Turing. Here's what he developed. Here's what his ideas. Maybe I had heard of him and those ideas had just fallen out of my head. But this story, right? And then, of course, there's this film in which he's in. Um, the Imitation Game. Thank you. The Imitation Game. Now, I know that's different because that's fictional. And so we have to be a little bit careful about how we're thinking about fictionalized accounts of science and how that helps us remember science. Except that I would just say I would admit that they have great power. And maybe with that, we have to be careful. We have some responsibility there. Because once something gets into a popular film, that is the fact for many people, right? So... Whatever was fictionalized about Turing's life in that film, everybody now thinks of Alan Turing that way because <clears throat> we saw the film and the story was great and it was very captivating. Um, but to your point, like I will say, yes, like there's something about, I think that you're talking about this textbook, which I think sounds fascinating, that it's humanizing the science and it's putting a sort of narrative around it and maybe also helps us understand like who are these scientists and how does science work um, that I think is really important. Yeah. Yeah. Uh in fact, that's something that maybe we can pursue further, the, uh, the role of uh, fictionalizing, uh, mm. you know, accounts of science or uh, appropriating scientific theories in science fiction. Uh, because, uh, you know, I would just, uh, it, again, it occurred to me while you were talking uh, that how far can we push uh, this fictionalizing? Because, yeah. uh, uh, I, I mean, I was, I was reminded of this French uh, writer called Alfred Jarry. Okay. He was in the 1920s. So basically, he uh, he came up with something what he called as uh, pataphysics, which is, you know, he was inspired by the fact that you know, all these scientists are essentially doing very crazy metaphysical experiments, you know, like sh the Schrodinger's cat or, you know, the Turing machine and stuff like that. And he thought, why not use those 
as cues for thought experiments that anybody could do. So, you know, so in some sense, uh, uh, possibly fictionalizing could give us a sense of the role metaphors play in science, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you know, by, as you say, deliberately distorting it. But then again, the danger becomes, I think what you're trying to hint at is that there could be a certain conception of science, broadly speaking, a conception of artificial intelligence or genetics, which is broadly caricatured and then stands for the real account of how things are. So, yeah, is that what you're saying? Yeah, like I think it's really interesting to just sort of think to yourself, okay, where are there films in which we see science and scientists portrayed? And then what kind of messages do they send us? And I will say it's all over, right? There, Meaning it, it's varied. But for some reason, the first one that always comes to mind for me is Jurassic Park, yeah, right? Yeah. So we have these sort of, the scientists in, in that film in the lab actually seem very unaware or unconcerned with what they're doing. They're just doing genetics in the lab, right? Like that's their job. And then we have the sort of, theoretical kind of goofy Jeff Goldblum character that seems important there um, but the scientists themselves I mean the science is important in the book in Michael Crichton's original book but in the movie the I don't know the scientists characters don't I, they don't really speak so well to science right so like Jeff Goldblum is so theoretical that he doesn't I can't remember his name I'm just, the character's name but neither do I <clears throat> but that he seems to, you know, to, to be theoretical in this space that, like, he doesn't care if human lives are in danger. He just cares about, like, pure science or science for science sake, right? Mm -hmm. And then the people in the lab actually just sort of seem like drones who yeah, are, you know, yeah. so there's that one. And then there's, I'm sure there's a few others that we can think of. So asking, like, how do popular representations sort of um, change the way we think about science? I mean, I think some research would need to be done to really know how that sways popular opinion. But I think that that certainly matters. And I think that there is something important to just sort of deciding, like, how does that help people um, know things about science? Like, I know, you know, when COVID was really raging, people kept talking about how this movie, this older movie from, I think, the 90s outbreak, suddenly became really popular to watch again, right? And that many of the scientists were angry because an outbreak, you know, this sort of plague-like thing starts and then it just spreads immediately. Like, People are, people are like getting sick and dying within, you know, a couple of hours and the cure is the same way. And it just didn't really have anything to do with the way um, diseases really spread. But like it gets into popular imagination. These are the things that we can see where a science paper, like it's really hard for me to see how disease spreads by reading those numbers, right? Like if I'm just sort of an average person. So yeah, I mean, I think I, all I'm really doing is agreeing with what you've said, what you sort of implied in your question that... There, there is something that I think a film can capture and get into our imagination in a sort of permanent way yeah. um, that is not reality and yet can sort of become our reality. Yeah. Which leads me to believe, like, leads me to sort of think about the way in which um, <clears throat> we have this way of um, projecting sort of these um, negative dystopian scientific futures. Um, that I think get into our imagination. As you mentioned, right, this idea that rarely do we make a film about AI where anything good happens, right? I mean, my, I mean, my, my earliest introduction to AI was probably the film Terminator, right? Where these like um, f robots in the future take over and come back to kill all of humanity or whatever it is that they do, right? There's lots of killing <laughs> in that movie. Um, and then there's a few others where like the robot is always taking over and the, and the human who is responsible for making that robot is generally a problem, has never taken responsibility for his or her creation. So that almost becomes, it, it sort of feels like an inevitable future because we've told that story so many times. So when I think about science narratives, I'm wondering like, I mean, I don't mean to be a positivist, you know, just like positive for positive sake, but I'm wondering like, could we tell more hopeful stories? Could we tell stories in which this impossibility of actually solving the climate, the climate crisis, that we actually do solve it, or that we actually are responsible with our technology and we allow technology to make our life better instead of worse? Um, I would be curious to know if like we just play out the scenarios or the narratives we've already set for ourselves. And if that's the case, we have a responsibility maybe to tell different stories. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, given that you speak about films, uh, I was thinking about uh, 
you know other mediums which uh, science communication uh, could possibly exploit because uh, typically when we think of science communication i think the first thing that comes to mind is science writing but right. now that we have uh, you know the digital media we have memes and we have uh, you know sh instagram shorts and you know we have access to animation so <laughs> right. uh, so i mean how do you see science communication uh, sort of uh, hmm. uh, encompassing those other possibilities of these mediums so yeah that's a good question and i do want to admit um you know professionally i don't have a lot of experience with the way the field is going sort of outside of writing and i do have a few things there that i would say i mean for me, the place that I actually interface with science communication or science writing the most is through podcasts. You know, my two favorite American podcasts are um, This American Life and Radio Lab, and they're both science based. Radio Lab specifically is all about telling science stories. And one of the reasons why I enjoy it so much is that that science narrative that they create is based in, in good science. They're out talking to scientists but they can layer in sound in this way in which not only can we hear the sound of the interview, but they actually just do a creative thing with sound, right? So when there's like a big idea, you get this like wild and crazy sound. And when it, things get tense, right, then you hear a tense sound. So that is sort of like a thing that they do. Um, but it draws you in, you remember, you get engaged in this way. And so something a little more multimodal, multimedia like that, I think is maybe important in science communication. And then I think many of us, I mean, especially my generation, but I think even a little younger than me, you know, grew up learning science through documentaries, nature documentaries, right? David Attenborough narrating about some natural landscape is one of the reasons why I have an interest in, um, you know, biology. So I think all of that to be said, like, I, I guess I'm really just saying, like, there, of course, there is a space for science communication that is outside the printed form. And maybe the printed form will not always be the main way that people are engaging with science writing, um, or I guess I should say science communication. Yeah. And in fact, uh, the very fact that uh, science communication uh, does intersect with uh, so many different domains, uh, it brings me to the question which we discussed about uh, careers in science communication and I think uh, the very interesting distinction if you could bring out again between uh, science uh, communication and science journalism if you could please talk about that because yeah I think our audience would like to you know know that more great so you know the first thing I would say there is I do think that there are you know so many opportunities for people who are interested in science communication right so because I know now so many people some some are coming up through their education wanting to specifically focus on science communication and science journalism. But I also know a lot of people who have focused their education on science and now realize that some sort of outreach or writing or creative endeavor is a little bit more in line with how they want to spend their day to day. And so a couple things that come to mind for me. So first is I think knowing this distinction between broadly what I might call science journalism and science communication. I mean, I guess journalism probably nests in science communication, but here's what I mean. If I'm a science journalist, then <clears throat> a sort of typical assignment would go like this. Uh, a new bit of research has come out, right? Somebody has published some new research. So I'm given their new research paper and I'm asked to read it and then to interview the scientist, usually the lead author of the paper. And then I might start writing my article. Okay, here's this new discovery or finding or, you know, way of thinking about things. Um, but I really, as a journalist, I am um, really mandated to tell the whole story. So then I'll go out and interview other people, like who might be, who would be experts, but might not necessarily be friendly to the research. You know, they, they don't have to be hostile per se, but <clears throat> let's say, there's some, you know, new uh, research on some sort of like earthquake measurement tool. Okay, I'm going to write about it and I'm going to say what the lead author said. But I'm also going to go find some other geologists and I'm going to ask them, is this really new information? What do you really think about this, right? Is, uh, and do you think that the research is sound? Because if I'm not a geologist, I might not know for sure that this is good research. I might need an outside expert. So then that way I'm going to write about that, right? Some people are saying this is good. Some people are saying that this is bad, right? There was a great article recently. I just don't remember the title in the New York Times about some new um, 
there's some new genetically modified trees that were recently planted in the US. And the article starts by talking about the trees and the way in which the, the, the researchers who have developed these trees think that they are better for um, soaking up CO2. They seem like a really good idea. And then he goes, he or she goes and interviews three or four other scientists who are saying like, we actually think this is pretty irresponsible. They weren't in the lab long enough. They should be not out, sort of like out in the wild. They might spread, right? So we get this whole story. It's complex, it's complicated. So that's science journalism. Um, science communication is, is usually more aligned with a specific institution. So if I'm a science communicator that's been hired, I can be hired by a university, I can be hired by a research institution, and then my job there is actually to report on the science that's coming out of that university or coming out of that institution. And so it doesn't mean that my, my research and my work isn't just as good. It's still good, it's still factual, it's still great writing, but I might not be working to talk about whether this research is or isn't good. You know, like you're sort of hired by the, by the university or by the company to just sort of disseminate the information. And the only reason I say that is not necessarily to champion journalism over communication. I think there's value in both. I think it's nice to know for people who want to write, like one might really appeal to you, right? If you really want to be a journalist, if you like that kind of hard hitting work, if you really like that investigative piece, um, that's probably a better fit for you. But if what you really like to do is write science narratives and talk about new science that has come out, and you, you might not want to do the, the certain kinds of um, investigative journalism, then science communication might be a, yeah, a better fit. Yeah. I think uh, more or less come to the end of our podcast, but one question which still remains for me, which uh, I wanted to talk about is, uh, you know, when you spoke about good science magazines in the US. Uh, you spoke about Orion and how it's become uh, increasingly more accommodating of uh, diverse voices uh, rather than what you know we call the Eurocentric perspective on science and uh, like I was saying it sort of converges with a sort of a public discourse in our country about uh, you know reviving Indian science or reviving Indian approaches to science or ancient Indian science uh, and stuff like that. So, you know, can you can you talk more about that a little bit about what it means to have diverse perspectives within science? Yeah, I mean, and some of that spills out from science communication and into the actual science research world, right? We in the West and in the US specifically, I mean, we are known for good research for a reason. We do great research in the US and it's pretty rigorous. However, what we've done through, like historically, is we've done, we've been U.S.-based researchers, more often than not white and male U.S.-based researchers, doing research on more often than not white American populations. And then we've been publicizing that research as though it matters for everyone in the world, right? So I've just done some research on some white middle class kids in suburban New Jersey, but I'm going to tell you in, you know, urban Bangalore that this is how learning models work, right? So science, making sure that we realize that sometimes like science is uh, culturally dependent, right? That's true. It's not always just um, what, we, what we would call objective fact, right? Like science is dependent on culture, on place, um, and also the background of the people in, in the research world doing the research and being researched upon. And so I would just say broadly, I think we have a, more of a responsibility to make sure that there's first a diversity of voices in the science world itself, and then a diversity of voices in people who are then sort of disseminating that science information, right? So whether that's through journalism um, and magazines and podcasts and whatnot, because that, that is important in terms of the perspective that gets presented um, on both the, the, you know, the people and, and the science. But it's also about like the, the, uh, the opportunities also for science communicators, right? Like you, we don't want to just be giving opportunity to science communicators who fit sort of one, you know, social or racial or um, world strata. We want to make sure that there's opportunities for people um, from different backgrounds as well. Uh, how the very discourse of science uh, is in some sense used to spread misinformation. Uh, and when you especially don't have a 
great uh, levels of public literacy around science uh, the specific example she talked about you know there was some correlation being made between using the 5g terminal and you know uh, sort of uh, being infected with the virus so can you talk more about that yeah yeah i think it broadly speaks the question really broadly speaks to science literacy which is really hard because i think that that's a hard problem of not a hard, it's a big problem to work on mm. so on one hand <coughs> i think we have to realize <coughs> so sorry <coughs> that there is something called science literacy and that we have a responsibility maybe to work on it individually right with with our student populations or ourselves so you know science literacy means that i can i i know the steps to tell the difference between a kind of like dramatic whatsapp posting and um a well-researched scientific uh article um or a um, scientific journalist, uh, sorry, yeah, a, an article written by a science journalist, right? So I think on one hand, like, that work can be done by science communicators, but it can also just be done by educators in general, right? So how do we teach young people that, like, you know, what are the steps? Like, you know, you look at the title, you know, of an article, and if, it's, if it seems there just to scare you, that's probably the first indicator that this might not be good science journalism. But then you go and then you look at like, well, who wrote this, right? Who is the, the person who's publishing this? And then you can go look them up. Are they known generally for highly factual information? And then you can look up the name of the journalist, right? Are they someone who's been writing science journalism for a long time? And then can you be sure that this information actually came from the publication that it says it's from? I know the average person does not feel like they have time to do that. And yet if they're not doing that, then, you know, anything is believable right so like we can I can make anything look like a New York Times article and then I can post it somewhere so then I have to make sure that this article actually came from there but also when something comes up on my feed I think I have a responsibility to look it up and make sure that that's actually the case and so I would say where I would say science communication comes in there maybe is that science communicators realizing that they have a responsibility not just to get the story or to be entertaining or to catch our eye like we need them to be reliable we need them to be sure that they've done the research really well because when that sort of dissemination of science becomes untrustworthy we don't just stop trusting journalists we stop trusting science um, so i think those are at least some of the steps of course there's many other things that can probably be worked on in there but um, those are the things that come up for me so yeah, thanks a lot, Professor Jivy. I think you have your throat adequately parched <laughs> from generating all this discursive uh, wisdom for us, and we are really uh, uh, glad uh, for you to come here. And I, th I hope you all enjoyed the conversation. Certainly, I did. And I think we'll have more such uh, dialogues, and hopefully someday have you back for uh, more discussions around science and other topics. Great. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thanks.